Hello everyone, Ewan from Elixir Experts here. Today I'm going to discuss potential issues using the retrospective longest path method of delay analysis in dispute resolution and why it is potentially used by some parties. As demonstrated in my first video, I highlighted that the retrospective longest path method of delay analysis might prove unreliable in dispute resolution because the method does not take account of ongoing progress and what was critical at the time. Instead, it stands at the end of the project, looking back to ascertain what the longest path through the as-built program was. This can mean critical activities at the time are ignored and that critical delays are incorrectly allocated to non-critical activities of work. Indeed, it identifies a single critical path at the end of the project and does not account for switches in the critical path during a typical construction project, where it is more commonplace for the critical path to switch. I would add that the retrospective longest path method of delay analysis can be distinguished from a longest path analysis identifying criticality at points in time during a project. Since the retrospective longest path is identified at the end of the project, it is less helpful during the project as parties have to wait until the works are complete before conducting such an analysis. To this extent, it does not provide an early warning of delay to the project at the time. A further consequence of not identifying the actual or contemporaneous critical path at the time is that the method can struggle to deal with concurrency where multiple events are causing critical delay to completion at the same time. As such, it might not effectively differentiate between the various delay events happening concurrently. If the works are resequenced or rebaselined during the works, then the retrospective longest path method of analysis may not adequately capture changes in the project execution strategy at the time. This can potentially lead to an inaccurate assessment of the critical path and delay to the project by not taking account of changes in the critical path at the time, since the retrospective longest path is identified solely at the end of the project. In addition, a change to the planned intentions in a baseline program or re-baseline program can alter delay measurements, so care should be taken to measure to a valid baseline program and not an obsolete one. The method also relies upon accurate as-built data recording when works were carried out, as flawed or incomplete program data can compromise the reliability of the delay analysis. This method may be considered where there might be insufficient program updates available, but if these records are not available, then assembling an as-built program in appropriate detail is still likely to be difficult, as well as um, complex and resource-intensive. Even where an appropriate as-built program can be assembled, it is also necessary for logic to be inserted into the as-built program, which is not always a straightforward exercise to model how the works were carried out. It can also be difficult to model delays. Delays can be straightforward to model where they say relate to discrete periods with a clear start and finish date, such as for late design information. However, they may also be more difficult to model where they relate to achieving a lower productivity more generally for an activity which has also been affected by other delays. This can lead to unrepresentative delays being included in the analysis or possibly some delays either being ignored or exaggerated over others. The retrospective longest path method of delay analysis may also overlook mitigation or acceleration which can conceal or distort the true status of the works. So, why do parties use this method of delay analysis? Firstly, it is recognised in the Society of Construction Laws Delay and Disruption Protocol, 2nd edition, February 2017, as a legitimate method of analysis. If the circumstances are appropriate without switches in the critical path, then it can be a reliable method of delay analysis in dispute resolution. Secondly, it might be mandated by the contract as the method for assessing delay, and as such, a party may be obliged to use this method to assess delay. However, it is a retrospective method of analysis that requires the work to have been carried out to show 
actual critical delays, and so it is of less utilisation whilst the works are still being carried out. The retrospective longest path method of delay analysis is derived from as-built data and so represents what actually happened. This improves the robustness of the method of analysis by avoiding reliance on hypothetical arguments. The method can be performed where program updates either do not exist, are too few or potentially just unreliable. However, I would repeat my comment earlier though that producing an as-built program with delays from scratch can be a resource-intensive, uh, complex exercise. It is also a method that is simpler to perform than other methods because it identifies a single critical path at the end of the project, i.e. the as-built critical path. However, the as-built critical path should be distinguished from the actual or contemporaneous critical path which identifies what was critical at the time and in my experience this is more reliable in dispute resolution. The findings of the analysis are also potentially easier to communicate, whether they may be to a tribunal, a project stakeholder, the contractor, the owner or legal representatives, because the method only identifies the as-built critical path and does not address any switches in the actual critical path. As discussed, this can make the method less reliable in dispute resolution but possibly satisfactory for presenting to project stakeholders who are not delay experts. It may also be beneficial for one party to use the retrospective longest path method of delay analysis to maximise its commercial position by advancing a position that relies upon the as-built critical path and bypasses the actual or contemporaneous critical path as it suits the case to do so. There is also a potential to exaggerate the duration of delays, as discussed earlier. In summary, if the circumstances are appropriate, without switches in the critical path, then the retrospective longest path method of delay analysis can be a reliable method in dispute resolution when executed properly. That's it for now. Have a great day.